All right, so welcome to Math 389 Complex Analysis. And so we're going to do Schwarzlemmer and conformal maps today. If anybody can think of what movie I'm thinking of right now, you can get cultural extra credit. Uh, Spaceballs. Spaceballs, yes. <laughs> Excellent. And so what I want to do is I want to continue trying to give a value added by not just doing everything in the book. OK, so I'm going to trust you to read the book on things like Montel's Lemma and the real analysis prerequisites. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the special maps we've been looking at. So last time, we started looking at these new maps, you know, C alpha, which is equal to alpha minus Z over 1 minus alpha bar Z, where alpha is some complex number of absolute value less than 1. This function is clearly going to be well-defined. The only danger is the denominator being 0. And since alpha has absolute value less than 1, this would be fine as long as the absolute value of z is less than 1. Actually, it's OK if it's less than or equal to 1. Actually, it's OK if it's even a little bit more than 1. You can extend just a little bit beyond the unit sphere until z has value an absolute value of 1 over alpha bar. That's when things start to break down. So we did some, oops, seems to have overzoomed. OK, we did some you know, brute force algebra, and we showed that C alpha of C alpha is the identity. We showed that it was onto. So you give me any W, I can find a Z that's sent there. So no matter what's in your target space, you can find a way to get there. We also showed that it maps the unit circle to the unit circle. So this is going to be a bijection, one-to-one onto map. Now, there was a nice question. Do we know that it maps the boundary of the unit circle to the boundary of the unit circle? Yes, we showed over here. If you take z to be e to the i theta, and you go through and you do the algebra, then the absolute value of this is equal to 1. So it is mapping the boundary to the boundary. But that's not the same as saying it takes every point on the boundary, and you can hit every point on the boundary. So it may be it maps the boundary into the boundary, but not everything is hit. So can anybody think of a way to prove, and if you've already talked to me about this at breakfast, you've become mute. Can anybody think of a way to try to prove that it maps the boundary to the boundary and that you get everything on the boundary? Yes? Well, first that it's bijective and then like the stuff inside of the circle, it doesn't go to the boundary because it lacks the Good, monolith. good. And then also, uh, I don't know how to deal with things outside of the circle. Right, this is the problem. We know it maps the disk to the disk. So the interior gets mapped to the interior. We know the boundary is mapped to the boundary. But maybe the boundary is mapped only to a small subset. So there's two ways to try to prove this. Yes? You can buy the injectivity if you take two paths that map the same point or something. But I'm not claiming, I'm just trying to claim that it maps that it gets everything on the boundary, that nothing is missed. And then also, like, things that are, like, Z that's larger in absolute value gets mapped to another Z that's also larger in absolute value, so it doesn't get mapped to the boundary. So then by bijectivity, the boundary gets mapped to itself. Well, but it could be a proper map. We want to show that everything on the boundary is hit. I agree that it maps the boundary to the boundary. Well, everything is hit on the boundary by some point in C, and if no other point except why, why do we know it's hit by some point in C? Inside the, okay. inside the unit disk. Oh. And that's the problem. So one possibility is you could say was, look, imagine there's some point in the boundary that's not hit. There's got to be points, however, in the interior that are mapping towards this, right? Yes. So I think you could make a limit argument. If there was some point that's missed, we have to have points inside here. I don't know where they'll be, but there's got to be a sequence of points that somehow have to be getting closer and closer to this. And then in the limit, we have to hit this. So I think that's one way you could show that it has to be done. Another way you could do it is to remember what class? Real analysis. So F of a compact set is a compact set. So if we didn't have all of the boundary, then we'd have to be missing some points on the boundary. And that should be a problem. So for this, there's two things you need to do. First of all, 
you have to refresh yourself as to how do we prove that the image of a compact set is compact? Here, f is continuous. And then once we have that, if we didn't have everything, then we'd be missing something. And that's very similar to the argument we had there. There is one other approach that you can always do for problems like this to show that everything on the boundary is hit. What's the last approach we could do? Direct yeah, brute force. Fix you know, W on the boundary of the unit disk, find Z on the unit disk, such that you know, C alpha of Z equals W. This is going to give you an equation to solve. You know, clear the denominators, go through the algebra. When in doubt, do brute force, right? It may not be pleasant. Now, instead of doing brute force, what could you do? Instead of you doing the calculation, what could you do? Uh, Mathematica, some other thing, a high school student since you're in college, you know, freshman, you know, pass it down the line, right? So what I did is I wrote some code because I don't trust myself to do a lot of calculations like this. I want to build some intuition. We know C alpha composed with C alpha is the identity. It returns to itself. So you could ask, well, what would happen if I took C alpha and I took another C beta and I composed them? And then just because I was using Mathematica rather than using alpha and beta, I think I used A and B because that was just easier to type. And I could look at this function. Where does this function have as its input? Where should we look as the input? Would be a good choice. Oh no, I'm saying what 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 space? Not just one point. What, what should I take as the target space? What might be interesting to look at? Where did we study C alpha on what set? The unit disk. So C alpha takes the unit disk to the unit disk. So then I can apply C beta, and that will also take. So this is going to map the unit disk to the unit disk. Do you think this is going to be a one to one onto function? C alpha is one to one and on to. C beta is one to one and on to. And for today, alpha equals A, beta equals B. So the composition has to be one to one and on to. So we know we have a one to one on to function that takes the unit disk to the unit disk. What would be wonderful if it was true about C beta composed with C alpha? What would you love that to equal? I'm sorry, the identity function. Well, if it's the identity function, then that means for any A and B, they're inverses of each other. So I agree that that would be wonderful, but that would be way beyond you know, anything we can hope for. So dial it back a little bit. What would you like C beta or CB composed with C alpha to be? CBA or more generally C of C. Wouldn't it be nice if when we composed them, it was just the same as our map with just a different target point? Well, what's nice about this is how many parameters do I need to specify this map? One, I just have to figure out one point. So my goal today is to try to teach you how to sniff out theorems to prove. The book is really good about going through things line by line by line. And you know, this is how we take our path to get to the result. I want to give you a sense of how can you try to come up with the results you might try to prove. Now, if I give you some function cc from the unit disk to the unit disk, there's two points that are very well understood. Which two points would be really understood under this function? Zero. So zero goes to, nope, c. C, and C goes to zero. So if this is going to be some nice function of the form C, C, uh, there is a slight difference in how I'm saying those two words. Mm -hmm. Then let's see if we could figure out what that C would be. So we have C, B, C, A. Is there any point that would be easy to understand or any point that we should try to understand? What would be a good point to study this at? 
A. So if we take A, when we apply CA to A, where does that send A to? Zero. To zero. And then that's going to send A to, to CB of A. It's a natural point to try, but I don't think it's going to be a helpful point. Wait, I thought that A goes to zero, which then went to B. A goes to B. Yeah. Um, A goes to zero under the map CA. If we, if we evaluate CB composed with CA at A, CA sends A to zero. And then CB sends zero to B. Yeah. Oh, sorry, this, this, this goes to B, sorry. This goes to B, sorry, yes. Um, what I wrote is correct, it just simplifies to B, yes. Okay, so this sends A to B. There's a better point to try first. Zero, because we know zero goes to something. So if we apply zero, zero goes to what? We first apply CA. So CA sends zero to A, and then that's gonna send that to CB of A. So if, this, if it's going to work, what's the only C that could conceivably work? Right. So only, only chance is C equals CB of A. And so I tried various things. Um, let's see if I can. So great. So this is showing up over here. And so I'm just clearing A and B just to make sure that there's nothing stored in memory. I'm defining my function C as C of Z of a point, point minus Z over one minus conjugate of the point times Z. I looked at C of C of Z, A, A. So that's basically applying C twice. If I apply C twice, what should I get? Identity. And the first output is Z. I got the identity. Good. Then I applied, first I applied C of A, then I applied C of B and I got this mess over here. Then I applied um, C at the point B comma A, and I got this mess. And then over here I applied, okay. So basically what I'm doing here is I just, um, I think might've flipped the order. No, okay. All right. All right. So when I looked at this, I have, my predictions. So does the output line 20, uh, sorry, 250 equal line 251? Is it immediately clear when you look at them if these are the same or not? You can start to try to do some algebra to see if they're the same. So you could try multiplying through, right? How can you tell if two functions are the same? You ask mathematically to subtract them and evaluate them at a point. And so that's what I did over here is I just subtracted them and I evaluated and got 1.03. Are they the same? No, but I, I did hear C, C, B, A. Maybe I made a mistake and maybe it's supposed to be not B, A, but maybe it's supposed to be A, B and maybe I put them in the wrong way. This is why I love doing it on the computer. All I have to do Minimum typing, 0.37. Either way is wrong. So they're not the same. Okay. So I'm sorry. Wait, no, no, no. Well, no, if I, they both can't be flipped. So if I flip, so if I, even if I had a flipping mistake, if I flip both of them to check to see if I made a mistake, then I'm not going to notice any mistake. But if I flip just one of them, I should detect the flipping mistake. So I've now done it both ways. So just in case I made a mistake, you know, I'm very nervous. I've got a guest here today. You know, I don't want to look bad because you know, Williams' reputation is on the line. So I, I checked it both ways. It doesn't work. Okay. There's a lot of jokes I love. One of my favorites is someone's car is not working. So they bring it to the shop. Kanik opens up the hood, looks at it for a second, turns a screw, car is now working perfectly and says $200. Person is furious. $200 for turning a screw? I'm not gonna pay you $200 for turning a screw. You guys, no, 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 no. It's not $200 for turning a screw. Does anybody know the punchline? 
two for ten years to know how to make them work too. It's one dollar for turning the screw. It's one hundred ninety nine dollars for knowing which screw to turn. The big thing is what should we look at? How should we gather data? So the natural suggestion here was to tell if two things were the same, to subtract. And if they're the same, what should we get? Zero. Is there any other way to tell if two things are the same rather than subtracting? Dividing, right? We could divide the two. And what a coincidence, the very next slide happens to have results of division. You know, I debated trying to play this up and then have them slowly reveal one at a time or have you give me the points, but this is deep enough in the semester that you know the game is rigged, right? So I'm not even gonna bother. Oh, it's no longer showing it. It's, it's the, the computer has somehow taken over, so I have to reclaim the video. Sorry about that. Or maybe it will be then dramatic. <laughs> All right. So I'm starting the broadcast. Okay. Hmm. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, there we go. Okay. There we go. So now I chose two different values. I chose values for A and B. I chose A to be exponential of i pi over four divided by two. I chose B to be exponential of i pi over three divided by two. So these are numbers that are clearly absolute value less than one. And in the first case, I chose Z to be exponential of i pi over seven divided by 13. The next one, i pi over five divided by 12. And just in case you thought these numbers were too nice, I divided by the square root of two for the third. Is it possible that I spent you know, two hours carefully going through Or do you think this is always going to be? And so I'm looking at the ratio of the two and I'm taking the absolute value. Do you believe this or do you want more data? I mean, I believe that those four eights will work and that uh, But do you trust this or do you, do you think I jerry rigged this? Do you want more data? You want more data? Such a trusting group. All right, fine. All right, so we'll come down here uh, to the end of the file. It should be good. It's just displaying now. All right, so I'll take the last one. Yes. So just to make sure I understand this, you subtracted them first? I subtracted them first, and I did not get zero. You so, took the absolute value? Or well, uh, subtracted I, I, I subtracted the output, and it was not zero. So the two functions were not the same. But you always got like a real. Like, well, I. I um, I can't remember if I took the absolute value when I subtracted them or not. I might have taken the absolute value. I did, okay. Um, so now I'm taking the ratios. Okay, so for the last one, instead of e to the i pi over square root of two, what do you want me to have? <laughs> square root of 35? <laughs> or, uh, square root of 35? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> And instead of 19, uh, can I ask what year you graduated, sir? 92. 92. So we'll put in a 92 over here. <laughs> All right. Over here, does anybody want to change the i pi over 4? <laughs> 5 pi over 5? I'm not going to do. I, 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 I pi over 5. Okay. I pi over 5, I will do. And do you still want the 2 over there? Like this is like a card trick. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 like right, well, what if I put in E? Yeah. Exponential of one. All right. What about over here? We are we comfortable with this one at least? Sure. Yeah. So you, oh, so you, so you, you let me keep this one. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No one did change it. Change it divided by three to divide by three. Eighty. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. I was going to divide by pi. Um, I do that. No, no. <laughs> uh, well, no, that, that gives you an okay. You want me to divide by 383? All right, 383. All right. And do you want two over here? What do you, what do you want? 323. <laughs> so you know, they do let professors choose their course numbers, and I have in the past chosen my numbers deliberately for various times in the year. <laughs> so they still all come out as a one. <laughs> 
Are you convinced now? Yes. Yes. Wait, I'm convinced. I'm just a little bit confused about how the subtraction thing could have failed yes. with the ratio of folds. So what does it mean if the ratio is one? I'm looking at the absolute value. Wait, is it that just showing uh, that there's... Oh, okay, there we go. So what have you just figured out? It's like up to a negative. Be, be a little bit, well, come on, we're, we're in a complex analysis class. It's more than just up to a negative sign. Up to a rotation. Up to a rotation. So instead of plotting the absolute value, what might be more interesting to plot? The angle. The angle, right? You know, instead of calculating this, you know, for the first two, they have the same A and B. So it could be the case that they differ by a different angle at different points, but maybe they always differ by the same angle. Would you like to see if that's the case? All right, so now what I will do is I will get rid of the numerical because I don't want the numerical. And we'll see if this works. <laughs> well, wait. so I was being a little fun. That's not what I have to get rid of. You want to see the angle, I have to get rid of the absolute value. I have to change the definition of h. The numerical is fine. It's just displaying it numerically. It's over here in the definition of h, I'm looking at the ratio and I'm taking the absolute value. I have to get rid of the absolute value. Uh, I think so. Is argument just ARG in Mathematica? So one thing is we can just try it. The other thing is you can do question mark ARG and it gives the argument of a complex number. So let's try doing this. 2.9714, 2.9714. So I chose two different things with the same A and B. I can take uh, your number here with those lovely choices of A, B, and C. And now what I'll do is I'll just change, instead of the square root of 35, let's do 35 exponential of 0.25. All right. Well, it's kind of interesting how close it is to pi, minus pi, but interesting. Um, I, I think we can all agree that these are not cherry-picked numbers at this point, yeah. that something is going on, OK? Eventually, some of you are going to go to graduate school and you're going to have to prove theorems. We don't appreciate this nearly enough when we're young. It's extremely valuable to have an idea of what your target is. What are you trying to prove? Now that you've seen all of this, what might you conjecture about C B composed with C alpha? Uh, C A. Do you think that this has to equal a C sub C? We just showed that the natural candidate failed. So this cannot be your theorem. So how would you fix this? Based on the data you just saw, how would you fix this? Yeah. And it should be some function of A and B. Because you know, from looking at our data, we got the same argument when we change the points. Now again, I only did you know, four points. This is not a tremendous amount of data. I could easily do a lot more data. Do you want to see me doing those calculations by hand? Do you want to do those calculations by hand? No, this is why you need to learn how to program. You do not have to learn well enough to write 10,000 lines of code, but you have to learn well enough to be able to write simple code to do some quick calculations and build some intuition. This has suggested, but hopefully is the next slide, yes. The following theorem. If f is an automorphism of the disk, then there exists a theta and an alpha such that it has to be of this form. OK? And we came to this theorem by a special case. And again, this theorem is far more general than what we do. We were basically saying, if we take two of these functions c and compose them, it's almost another function c. It's another function c up to a rotation. When I'm trying to understand what goes on in a unit disk, is a rotation a big deal? What does a rotation do? It just gives it its bijection from the disk to itself. Okay, but the, we'll, we'll always talk about bijections from the disk to itself. What does a rotation do? Yeah, it just turns everything equally. 
It just rotates, right? <laughs> everything moves together. You, know, you can look at the clock and see the second hand. It just, everything is just pushed the same amount. Does it really make any difference in studying? It's just changing where you, you orange your axis. It's not a big deal. So, yes. Uh, I'm a little bit confused on why every automorphism should be at this one. Like so that, that that's that's stronger. What we've done suggests that this is true if you take two automorphisms of the form C. C right. This is a more general statement. It's even stronger. Okay. So imagine, and we're going to just do a sketch now. We're not going to prove it right now. Imagine F from D to D is an automorphism. Okay. Without loss of generality, where does zero go? Zero. zero. How can we ensure it goes to zero? We could look at F composed with, let's say F of zero is equal to some number A. Okay. We could look at F composed with CA. And now that's going to take zero. Oh, wait a minute. Um, I, I might be off by an inverse. So all right, uh, th th there's several ways of, of, of saying this. Uh, let's do it this way. We know it's an automorphism. So we know there exists an A such that F of A equals zero. Some point has to be sent to zero, right? And so now if I take CA of zero, that's going to just be A. So F of CA of zero is gonna be F of A is zero. So if I look at this choice of CA, it's gonna send zero to zero. So if I give you an automorphism, I can always adjust things so that it sends zero to zero. And then the claim is once you do that, the only thing that's left is a rotation. Okay, that's what we're going to have to use the Schwartz lemma to prove. But the first step is always the simplification. Let's make life easy. We can always, you know, adjust things so that zero is sent to zero. This is such a common theme. When you do Taylor series, what point do you like to expand about? Zero. You just adjust things so that this is when you know, time is zero. This is the time that we care about. So we first adjust things so that zero is sent to zero. And then we're going to show that this forces us to be a rotation. So forces F composed with CA to be a rotation. Okay. So hopefully this motivates uh, why we're now going to go into the Schwartz lemma. We start off with these functions C, we saw what they did, we saw they had some interesting properties. And a natural question to ask is, if you have a set of objects, what happens when you combine them? Wouldn't it be wonderful if when you took two C's and combined them, you got another C? You don't. But you don't differ by much. What do you differ by? A rotation. So in its infinite wisdom, Williams is letting me teach abstract algebra in the spring. I'd love to see any of you there if any of you haven't taken abstract algebra. I've actually never taken abstract algebra. I've taught it before at Brown, but I've never actually taken it. One of the things you like to do in abstract algebra is you talk about equivalences. You know, you're used to clock arithmetic. You know, it's 11 o'clock now. What time will it be in three hours? Two. two. So we're all saying 11 plus three is two. E no. But 11 plus three equals two. We can interpret this as two and 14 are the same mod 12. They differ by a multiple of 12. They're equivalent up to a multiple of 12. But when I'm trying to understand what's going on, these are equivalent up to a rotation. So I could introduce this as an equivalence class to study. And I can only imagine what the blue sheets would be you know, if I did this as an equivalence class. So if any of you take abstract algebra, I will absolutely put something like this on, but we're trying to find what do we care up to an equivalence. We did this when we did the Weierstrass products. You know, if I give you a set of zeros, does that uniquely determine the function? No it determines the function up to an exponential. 
So we could say two functions are equivalent if their ratio has no zeros, has no poles, and then we'll know that we can write it as the exponential of a holomorphic function. So just, you know, how many of you have taken abstract algebra? It's only two of us have not taken abstract algebra in this class. Um, but I'll at least be teaching it, so that should count for something. All right, so here is the Schwartz lemma. There are three statements. First, f is from the disk to the disk. It's holomorphic, and f of zero is zero. And the reason we say f of zero is zero is, look, let's just standardize things. And if we send f to another point, then we have to worry about comparing different things. We can standardize a little bit. We have a little bit of freedom. We can always choose f of zero to be zero. We could even put in a rotation if we wanted so that maybe the point one, which has to go to the boundary, we could even put in a nice rotation so that one goes to one. We can easily do something like that. But, so the Schwartz lemma has three statements. The first is the absolute value of f of z is less equal to the absolute value of z for all z in the disk. The second is if there's some point z naught in the disk other than zero, where they have the same absolute value, then f is a rotation. Why do we have to say z not not not? This is a funny. It's just a fun way to say z not is not equal to zero. Z not not not. <laughs> Why can't z not be zero and have that implied that f is a rotation? Why does z not have to be a non-zero number for this to imply that we have a rotation? Okay, but when you multiply it. Zero by a non zero number zero. Uh, half is one zero. So that's not the answer. Okay. And so we know that f of zero is zero. So we know this inequality is true at zero. So if it was okay for z naught to equal zero, then f we would only have rotations. Well, maybe that's the case. Maybe there's no map that sends zero to zero other than a rotation. Isn't it saying send zero to zero, but then send the magnitude to another point to the same magnitude? It's not just saying, it's like for two points. Right? It's saying uh, for two points, and that second point can't be zero. Right. Because we, we, we know from the normalization that f of zero is going to be zero. If we add this condition that there's some point, we haven't added any new information. We've already got that in the, in the givens to the problem. Does the condition have to be uniform? It's gotta be uniform. So it's gotta be, you know, z goes to e to the i theta times. It's one fixed number for all inputs. But if you let z not be equal to zero, you could still, you, you would think of a dilation of the rotation. Uh, we don't necessarily have a dilation. Like the map z sends z. But that's not going to map the unit disk to the unit disk. That's going to explode. Yeah. So we've got to still map the unit disk to the unit disk. So if z naught was allowed to be zero, then we're not getting any information. It's an, it's an empty statement. And then the last one that the first derivative is at most one in absolute value at zero. And if it holds, if equality holds, then it's a rotation. So the whole point of this is to try to classify maps that have certain properties, and we try to standardize things. We send zero to zero just to make it, so we're comparing apples and apples. Okay, so let's see if I can remember how to do this. So the first one is we want to show that f of z is always less equal to z naught. Yes? Sorry. Um, so wouldn't, we, wouldn't all z not have to get, like wouldn't that have to hold true for all z naught if f is a rotation? Right, but so what it's basically saying is, if you know it's true for one point, then it's going to be a rotation, then it's true for everything. So it's, it's an example of when you get a small little bit of information, the consequences become profound. So if it's true at one point, it's not true at every point. Yes. All right, so let's try to prove that f of z is always less equal to z in absolute value. Yes. I had a question last time. Yep. Is there a nice example of a map that sends 0 to 0 and is homomorphic but doesn't play the second property, like for which no other point is the second thing that would do? Um, so we send zero to zero. Yeah, some app that doesn't have any not that essentially says that. I don't think so. I mean, because we have our classification theorem coming up, right? 
So that so number two, like they're always false. Like like Z squared is not going to be an is not going to be a bijection. I know, but I was, it's oh, that's right, that's right. This is not saying it's, it has to be a bijection. Good. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. So Z, Z squared would be a great example. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, this is the danger of you sometimes read things that are not into it. I'm reading into this that my function is a bijection, but at this point, it does not have to be a bijection. Z squared is a great example. So let's try to prove that f of z is always less than equal to z in absolute value. Let's look at f of z over z. Uh, so we'll say z is in the disk about zero of radius r. So the absolute value of z would be less than equal to r. And we'll study z of z is f of z over z. Is this function well defined? So for z not equal to zero, everything is fine. But what if z equals zero is this function well defined? Right, we know f of zero is zero. So this is okay at z equals zero as f of zero equals zero. So holomorphic. So we have a holomorphic function. And what we're doing is, you know, here we have a unit circle, and then we have a slightly smaller circle of radius r. And we're studying what goes on inside the circle of radius r. So we're looking at g of z equals f of z over z. Well, let's look at the absolute value. What can you tell me about f of z? How large is the absolute value of f of z? It is? It's, it's, it's one, because it maps the unit disk to the unit disk. So f of z is at most one, as your f maps disk to disk, the absolute value of f of z has to be at most one. Now, by the maximum modulus principle, the largest value has to be on the boundary. So we know g of z has to be less than equal to 1 over r for all z whose absolute value is less than r. Now, we can just take r getting closer and closer and closer to 1. Just keep expanding it out. So take limit as r goes to 1, and we get g of z has to be less than equal to 1. Because as r gets closer and closer to 1, this bound is going to be falling and falling and falling to 1. So in the limit, it's going to go down to 1. So if we get that g of z is less than equal to 1, this means f of z is going to be less than equal to the absolute value of z. And so we're using the maximum modulus principle. So what does the max modulus principle follow from? Roche. And what does Roche follow from? Argument principle. So this is either a consequence of the Roche theorem or it's a consequence of the argument principle, which gives us Roche theorem, which gives us this. OK, so that's the first statement. The next statement is that for some z naught not equal to zero, we have f of z naught in absolute value is the same as the absolute value of z naught, then f has to be a rotation. So what's the proof? So we know that f of z over z attains its maximum in the interior and must be a constant. Why do we know that? Well, in this case, we have, you know, again, g of z is f of z over z. And we know that the absolute value of g of z is less than equal to 1. But if there exists a z naught such that f of z naught in absolute value is the same as z naught in absolute value, that implies g of z naught in absolute value equals 1, which implies g is constant by the maximum modulus. 
right? So again, we're using the maximum modulus principle. Again, if there's one point where they're the same, then now we have G attaining its maximum in absolute value in the interior. The only way that can happen is if G is constant. So that means we can write G as some constant, say C. So if we have G of Z equals C, that implies F of Z equals C times Z. What must be true about that value C? C has to have absolute value one. Because if it didn't have absolute value one, then when I plug in Z naught, they can't have the same size. As the absolute value of F of Z naught equals the absolute value of Z naught, that implies the absolute value of C equals one, or I can write C as e to the i theta. And there you go. And now we know that F is a rotation. So once there's one point where they have the same absolute value, F is a rotation. All right. Uh, the last one is that if the first derivative is zero, I'm sorry, if the first derivative at zero is equal to one, then F is a rotation. And in general, the first derivative at zero is at most one. OK, so the proof is observe yet again, looking at F of z over z. This is a great function to look at. And it's well defined because we know f of zero is zero, so this is okay. We know g of z is at most one in the region. And now we do one of my favorite tricks. We do nothing, right? What are the ways you can do nothing in life? Add zero and multiply by one. We're going to add zero. We're going to look at f of z minus f of zero divided by z. What does f of zero equal? And I can write z as what? z minus zero, <laughs> right? If I write it like that, it should be clear. This is the definition of the derivative of f at zero. So g of zero is just f prime of zero. But we know that g is at most one in absolute value. So since g is at most one in absolute value, we know f prime of zero is at most one in absolute value. So as the absolute value of g of z is less than equal to one, we know that f prime of zero has to be less than equal to one. And that gives us the first statement. The next statement is that if f prime of zero happens to equal one, well, then g of zero equals one. And by the maximum modulus principle, again, we get that g has to be constant, has to be a rotation. So we're basically finding ways to deduce when something is a rotation. If I have a situation where I have an automorphism of the disk, I can always apply one of my C functions so that I now send zero to zero. And I'm claiming that once I do that, the only thing that's left is a rotation. This allows us to completely classify automorphisms of the unit disk that fix the, that fix the origin. OK. Um, I'm going to skip this. So in the interest of time, I want to just mention a few brief remarks from previous iterations of this class and leave you with a challenge. So one of the ways you are successful in life is you try to multitask or you try to get credit for doing the same thing for many different groups. And so I've actually had students write research papers from taking classes with me. And so years ago, I asked, what would happen if we try to compare the Schwartz lemma from complex analysis with the analog and real analysis? So in complex, we just showed if you fix the origin and you're a bijection from the disk to the disk, then the first derivative at the origin is at most one in absolute value. In real analysis, what happens? And so we played with some examples um, and we were able to show that you could actually find families where you could make the derivative arbitrarily large at the origin. And we explicitly wrote them down and we published you know, a really short paper um, with myself and a student uh, here from you know, a couple of years ago. And so we showed that you know, in the real case, um, we can make the derivative arbitrarily large at the origin and still have an injection, a bijection from minus one, one to minus one, one. Now, what can we do in complex analysis? We know, let's say F maps D to D, let's say it's an automorphism. We know F of zero is zero. I do not know the for what's coming. I am proposing this as a problem. 
I am happy to work with you. I'm happy for you all to work with each other. What do we know about F prime of zero? Absolute value is less equal to one. So what do you think my question is? Fourth of zero. And I'm deliberately not telling you my question in case you have a better question than I do. And then I'll say, oh yeah, that's what I was thinking. No, I'll be honest. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nope. I mean, the real case, we know that you can have F prime of zero as large as you want. I'm, I want a complex case. What should be my question? I know F of zero is zero. I know the first derivative is the most one in absolute value. What's my next question? How about higher derivatives? How about higher derivatives? Well, that actually was my question. What can you say about F double prime of zero? Is there any bound on that? The answer might be no. I'm not a complex analyst. I just teach the class here. I know enough so that I can apply it to number theory. This may be known. Could you Google it and see if it's known? Yes, but don't. You know, have the fun to play with it. And you might come up with a different approach. There's something else you could try. Can anybody think of another question? Yes. Like, how is the derivative bounded at other points in this? So you could try other questions. You know, maybe the maximum of z in the disk of f prime of z. Yeah. Now, maybe you might be able to answer this quickly by moving things back to the origin. Yes? OK. So what would you do for the primitive? Uh, There'd have to be uh, certain um, conditions that get to set on the path for that, right? So would we want to integrate along certain paths? We could migrate over the DSS. Okay. Uh, like around like radius r plus than one. Okay, so I'm gonna put this in a different color because it's a different type of question. Maybe integrate f of z dz. You want it over some curve? Yeah. Um, so let's say the boundary of a disk um, centered at some point z naught of radius r. The problem is I know what that answer is. What's that answer? Oh, it's holomorphic, so what is it? So that's zero. Yes? Uh, is it not true that if we have a component map, then it's derivative, it's not So we have a conformal map. Um, the derivative is definitely going to be differentiable, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a conformal map. I mean, if I gave you, say, z plus z to the fifth, if I take the derivative, I would then get maybe one plus uh, five z to the fourth. And that plus five z to the fourth um, worries me. The, the, the one is just going to shift things up. So this is not going to work. What if I gave you, how could I modify the integral of f of z to have something that might be worth doing? Uh, maybe this side. So for instance, we do know that f could potentially, if f is the C function, it could blow up at some point. So if we take the disk, if you know, R is greater than one, it can blow up. Or could look at maybe F prime over F. Yeah. If we take the logarithmic derivative, that, could, that would count the number of zeros. What do we know about that? Is at most one, right? So you know, is there a nice way to figure out when we count one? And I'll end with one last question. Maybe the maximum of maybe f prime of zero plus f double prime of zero, maybe add the absolute values. So maybe if I have f prime large, that's going to force f double prime to be small. Maybe if 
maybe I can make f double prime large by making f prime small. What's the logic that can make maybe the sum of the two derivatives? Yes. Wait, is it true that if f is an open map, then f is also open map? Yes. But then. Wait a minute. Um, yes, because if it's holomorphic. Right. But then we, we can't change the maximum of that open map. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is this is at zero. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, but we we can, we can sort of take the limit as we go in the set. So unless it's the closure. Yeah. So sure, we should we should we should definitely put. Well, a better thing is to use the supremum. So if I use the if I use the word supremum, then it's fine. All right. So this is a good place to stop. But what I wanted you to see today is that you can get research questions very quickly. 